All right, so it looks like everybody is connected. So we will go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Alexis Pelletier Bowie. I'm the Associate Program Director at Cooper Medical School of Rowan University, where I also serve as our EM subspecialty advisor. And you may know me more from my roles in the Application Process Improvement Committee and Advising Students Committee as past chairs to both of these groups. Liz, you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, and I am Liz Worley. I'm the former program director at Penn State Health in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and the current chair of the Application Process Improvement Committee here with CORD. All right, so you may have heard us introduce this topic at CORD Academic Assembly, but today we get to expand on it a bit. So as you may or may not have heard by now, the IRIS application is going to look very different for the upcoming residency application season and beyond. And as I'm sure you guys know, uh, Liz and I are your representatives to the ARES Supplemental Application Working Group, um, which will now be, I believe, just the ARES Working Group. Um, so as your working group uh, representatives for emergency medicine, we wanted to let you know about these upcoming changes. And really, before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to thank um, Richard Peng and the ARES team for providing uh, the slides or some of the slides and a lot of the data here today. So before we get started talking about the changes, we should probably say why these changes are occurring. And that's because the ARIS application as it currently stands is more than 20 years old. Obviously, a ton has happened in the residency application process during this time. So residency application numbers um, per program and those um, sent out per applicant have increased dramatically across all specialties over the past 20 years. The number of residency programs have increased. Step one has gone from um, scored to pass fail. Um, and there's really been a bigger focus on holistic application review. At the same time, there's been a lot of changes in technology over this time as well. So ERIS really needed to get with the changes and um, update the application in a way that was useful for both applicants and programs. So the ARIS supplemental application was the AAMC's attempt at trying out um, these potential changes to the overall residency application process. They started with the three specialties that are highlighted here in blue and then expanded. That was two years ago. And then they expanded to 16 specialties this past year, of which emergency medicine was one of them. And there were three main goals of the supplemental application. Um, first was to update the questions on the ARIS application to reflect current societal and educational context. Um, many changes have occurred in our society, and we know that medical education and training has, tra has um, changed immensely since the last time the content of the ARIS application was updated way back in 1996. Um, program directors in all specialties really noted that they want to learn about applicants' interests and their non-academic preparation for residency. And then applicants and advisors really wanted programs to look more, um, more than just at board scores or what medical schools they're graduating from when deciding who to interview. So the SUP app was designed to help applicants share more information about themselves and their medical education journey. And as most of us are aware, the current ARIS application is extremely difficult to review um, all of the content at once. And it takes a significant amount of time for each application given all of the text-based fields. Um, with the high volume of applications that many programs receive, it's really just not feasible to go that in depth on every single application. So ARIS is now trying to provide uh, better and more structured information about applicants to help drive a more holistic review. Uh, so there's numerous sources of information from which the AAMC uses to evaluate and refine the My ARIS content. Um, over the past two years, they've analyzed various aspects of the SUP app through uh, surveys of applicants, advisors, and uh, program directors, working group meetings with representatives such as myself and Alexis uh, from all of the participating specialties, and focus groups uh, with all of the stakeholders, and then analysis of all of the data within the supplemental app over the past two years. And through these analyses, um, they determined which components have been more successful compared to others and are going to be integrated into the new upcoming My Aris application. And with these changes in place, the AAMC is targeting an application that better supports and enables that holistic review that we're all looking for, while still promoting fairness in the evaluation of applicants and improving the efficiency of the overall process 
to make it easier for both applicants to complete and for programs to use. So we do wanna pause here for just a second and make one minor clarification. The changes that we're discussing today vary slightly between residency and fellowship programs. The three changes that we're going to discuss, namely the updated experiences section, the geographic preferences and program signaling apply to residency applications. Fellowship applications are also going to benefit from the reorganized experiences section, as well as the geographic preferences, but they will not have the option of uh, program signaling for this coming uh, application cycle. So for the sake of this presentation, whenever we refer to this, we're um, specifically referring to the residency application process. So as you're all aware by now, EM participated in the SUP, uh, the SUP app this past year, um, but only for the signaling component. There were those two other components that I just referred to, namely the past experiences section and the geographic preferences section. Uh, the experiences section was designed to showcase who the applicant really is, um, as well as their journey uh, to residency by highlighting both their experiences that they identify as particularly meaningful, as well as any additional challenges or hardships that they may have overcome along their journey to residency. Um, there's some new information included in this section, such as the impactful experiences essay and some standardization in the way the applicant will be submitting this information, which we're going to talk a little bit more in depth on in just a bit. And the GeoPref section was designed, sorry about my dogs. <laughs> the GeoPref section was designed to give applicants um, those who wish to do so, the opportunity to describe their interest in a specific geographic region and a specific community setting along the spectrum of urban to rural. We know that both program directors and applicants view geographic location as a, a huge, very important factor for residency program selection. And up until this point, the Myers application didn't really have a standardized way for applicants to denote those preferences. And instead, we all know programs have been left to really infer the applicants' um, preferences based on surrogate information, such as applicants' hometown, location of residence, medical school uh, location, or their past experiences. Um, but even more importantly, now applicants have the opportunity to communicate exactly what their preferences are, and they get to explain the why behind it. So um, as you know, program signaling, gives applicants the chance to uh, express genuine interest in a residency program at the time of application. All right, so there was some value found in each of these three sections. So components of these sections will be integrated into the upcoming My Eris application. This means there is no more supplemental Eris application. Instead, as we said, there's updates to experiences for all applicants to all specialties. There is the addition of geographic preferences for all specialties and program signaling for the 20 specialties uh, that have decided to participate in this component. So we're going to get into um, the, the new changes for each of these sections, um, but one kind of overarching change uh, that will be in place is location standardization. So previously, applicants would free text in location for their address, their hometowns, their experiences, their education, and their training. Um, but now, ARIS is moving to standard collection, and that means that applicants will enter postal code, city, state, countries. Um, and this will really allow for more features to be developed in the future as well as research. Um, so because it's no longer free text, they did need to limit the number of hometowns that could be entered. And so they limited this to five hometowns. And interestingly, um, applicants can also indicate a setting for their hometown as well as um, some of these other uh, areas where they enter a location. And what I mean by that is urban, suburban, or rural if they choose to do so. And again, we'll explain more about what those settings are in the geo preferences section. 
All right, so let's jump straight in uh, to the experiences section itself. So the main goal of the updated experience section was really to enable and foster holistic application review. And they wanted to do so in a way that was efficient and easier for both applicants to complete and programs to review. So they did this by creating a more standardized format, which removed any irrelevant or unimportant information that was in the previous uh, edition of ERIS. It took away a lot of the free text areas and essay areas, and added mission-based filters, which is, I think, a huge win for programs to really identify those applicants that are a good mission match for their program. The other big goal was to focus on quality over quantity, so no more experience padding. So in the next slide, we'll kind of um, look at this a little bit more. So the way that they chose to focus on quality is by limiting the number of experiences to 10 total. And then applic applicants can choose from these 10 their top three most meaningful experiences. So why 10? Why was the number 10 chosen? So Liz mentioned those focus groups um, that uh, Eris had with applicants and PDs and advisors. And in those focus groups, again, efficiency was a big thing brought up by programs in what they want in the new ERIS application. And applicants were feeling pressure to really just add every single experience that they've ever had because they felt like more was more and there wasn't as much of a focus on quality. So they looked at the average number of experiences listed per applicant um, with the ERIS application over the past year, and that was 15 experiences or just under 15 and so they wanted to choose a number under this because if they kept it at 15, that would just be maintaining the status quo. So that's where the 10 came in. So for those experiences, we now have new experience types as well. So we still have the same research, volunteer service and advocacy and work experiences that were previously listed, but now we also have education and training, military service, professional organizations, extracurricular activities, clubs and hobbies, and teaching and mentoring. And I wanna make a few notes about each one of these. So, well, not everyone, a couple of them. So for education and training, this is not college, med school, post back. That is isn't another entirely different section. So applicants don't need to waste experiences on this. You will also see the addition of hobbies here under experiences. So hobbies will no longer be listed in the way that we're used to. And you may not see hobbies for a lot of applicants unless they decide that that particular hobby was worthwhile in mentioning in their limited number of experiences. Lastly, publications aren't included in this list. They are still in a separate section, so publications do not need to take up any of these experiences. For each of the experiences, applicants will have 750 characters, not words, characters, to describe their context, role, and responsibilities for each one of these. And then for their top three most meaningful, they will have another 300 characters to describe why these experiences were the most meaningful for them, what did they learn from them, what did they value about them. And for context, 300 characters is not very long. That's only two to five sentences. So we're not really replacing any of this with large essays. These are just small descriptions still. All right, so what number and percentage of applicants selected each experience type? The top three were the three that were already there, probably because advisors and applicants were familiar with this, but applicants still chose from all of the categories, um, which is really great. And um, as far as the amount of time spent in each experience, it was really in depth. So 76% of experiences were recurring, meaning either daily or weekly, and the average length of time sent, spent in each experience exceeded one year. Now, for each experience, applicants will also have the option to choose a setting, a focus area, and a key characteristic to associate with that experience. Right now, for this year, it is only single select. So applicants really need um, to think about which ones they are going to select for each different experience. And for the advisors out there, I would really... Um, kind of suggests that you tell your applicants to choose from a variety across these focus areas and key characteristics to avoid being filtered out by programs. And I don't think that programs are really going to use these to filter out people, but um, more so to hopefully filter them in for the things that are important for those programs. So you can see here in bold the most common experience uh, focus areas and key characteristics that were chosen. So again, a wide breadth, which hopefully um, shows that the new uh, ARIS application is really facilitating that holistic review um, that we were hoping for.
The other addition to the experience section is the other impactful experience essay. So this gives applicants the opportunity to explain any challenges or hardships that they overcome or they overcame in their journey to residency. This is completely optional and will not apply to all applicants. So please do not expect to see this for all applicants. What are some examples of hardships or challenges that you may expect to see? So family background, maybe this person is a first generation college student. Financial background, did they come from a low income family? Did they need to work throughout college or medical school to help support their family? Community setting, did they grow up with high poverty rates or in a, did they grow up in poverty with high crime rates or um, lack of access to medical care? What was their educational experience like growing up? Did they have access to advisors and mentors? And then general life experiences, maybe personal illness, family illness, or family death, needing to serve as a caregiver for a family member while going through school or starting a family of their own. So only 56% of applicants, so about half of applicants actually filled out the other impactful experience essay. So again, don't expect everybody to fill this out. There were no group differences by gender, but there were some differences by race, ethnicity, and applicant type. So underrepresented minorities in medicine did respond at higher rates than white applicants, and osteopathic and IMG applicants also responded at higher rates than allopathic applicants. So here you can see the top six most common themes that applicants chose to write about. And so um, you see persistence, resilience, and response to various obstacles and challenges was at the top. Also personal illness or illness or death of a family member, getting accepted to medical school residency, financial hardships, academic struggles, including testing, and first generation pursuing higher education or career in medicine. So while most of the responses discussed critical life experiences that aligned with the original intent of this question, other themes did emerge, such as academic struggles. And this just demonstrates the opportunity for more education to applicants and advisors about the original intent of the question and what content is or is not expected, as well as um, education that, again, it's not expected that everybody fills this out. All right, so now I'm going to be discussing the geographic preferences section. Um, as you can see here, um, in this map, these are the uh, nine different U.S. Census divisions. And in the GeoPref section, applicants can select up to three of these nine divisions shown on the map. And I know not everyone is in love with the, the U.S. Census divisions, but we had to come up with some kind of breakdown. And this one was already like built naturally by the U.S. Census. Um, so this is what they're piloting first. Um, applicants can, as I said, select up to three. And um, with each of those selections, they can provide a very short essay response describing what, why they have that divisional preference. Um, they also have the option to select that they do not have a preference at all and provide a short answer explanation um, behind that thought process. Um, applicants also have the ability to indicate if they have a particular practice setting preference along that whole spectrum of urban to suburban to rural, or again, that they have no preference in terms of environmental setting. And then they also get that uh, bonus essay question to explain that choice. Um, this data is going to be captured within the biographic information section of the My Eris application. So from the program perspective, this is what the geoprefs are going to look like. And it's gonna look very similar to what the signaling component looked like this past year. If your division is selected, you're going to see a yes plus the applicant's essay. If the applicant chooses that they do not have a, ge a geographic preference, you will see this response and the associated essay. However, if the applicant chooses a division in which your program is not located, or if the applicant chooses not to participate in this section, you're going to see nothing displayed. So that area will just essentially remain blank. This past year, most applicants ranging around 52 to 82% reported at least one divisional preference in all of the specialties that participated in the SUP app, except for one. Of those applicants with geographic preference, 96% included the short answer essay um, explaining their preference. And about 24% of participating applicants um, noted that they had no preference and 10% actually skipped the question altogether. 
So of the um, allopathic and osteopathic applicants who indicated a preference for at least one division, most of them indicated a division preference that aligned with their permanent address or their medical school location or the division in which the school was located. As shown in this graph, the effect was stronger for alignment with the applicant's permanent address, ranging from 86 to 95 percent. The smaller effect was seen with the medical school location, and that ranged from 52 to 89 percent. And anywhere from 46 to 81 percent of applicants reported no preference for that rural to urban spectrum in terms of environmental setting. Um, of those who did report having a preference, um, more of them had a preference for the urban location compared to rural. And these findings were pretty consistent across all of the participating specialties. Um, the very small percentage of applicants who had a preference for those rural locations um, kind of raises the question if this if this um, data is going to be more useful or valuable to those programs that are located in a more rural environment or those that include um, rural specific uh, training experiences or additional rotations and sites. And Factors considered most commonly by applicants when completing this section, as you can see here in descending order, includes proximity to family and friends, um, the location of the desired program, lifestyle factors. If the applicant has previous ties to that specific region, or um, as you can see, 40% of applicants considered future opportunities to practice in that location. So they kind of wanted to like plant themselves in an area where they may succeed in the future. Uh, of the respondents who selected they did not have a divisional preference, around 50% indicated that geography was not really um, as important to them, or they were concerned that programs might overlook their application if their geographic preference didn't um, align with that program. So next, we're going to spend the least amount of time on signaling because we are the most familiar with this as emergency medicine. Um, but we do want to go over some of the signaling experience from this past year that we want to share with you. So for the ARIS 2022-2023 application cycle, applicants on average across all specialties really maximized the use of signals. If they were given a certain number, they were right at that number or just below. Um, and that was uh, consistent across specialties. Um, white and non-white applicants sent a similar average number of signals as did men and women. Um, there were some smaller uh, differences between certain groups such as allopathic, osteopathic, and international medical grads, um, but these varied in difference uh, across, um, between the different specialties. And for emergency medicine, allopathic candidates actually sent slightly more signals compared to IMGs. Um, among the applicants who sent a geographic preference, more than three quarters of their signals were sent to programs located in the uh, census division that they actually preferred. So both their signal and their geographic preference aligned. On average, about 30 to 52% of programs of program signals were sent to programs located in a geographic division that aligned with their permanent address. And then a slightly smaller number, 26 to 45 percent, were sent um, signals or sent signals to a geographic location that aligned with their medical school location. So for those who are really curious about how signaling performed in EM, we're going to review that right now. So overall, 277 total EM programs could have participated and 261 either selected to participate or at least completed the steps necessary to get um, to participate in time before the deadline. Due to lack of adequate data for some of the programs, we were left with 236 EM programs in the final analytics sample. Um, so about 90% of participating supplemental um, ARIS application programs, so 90% of participating specialties and 86% of all overall EM uh, programs. And as you can see on the y-axis, it's the pr predicted probability of being invited to interview. And the x-axis is essentially whether or not the applicant sent a signal. Um, and plotted the little yellow or purple squares is the median predicted probability based on whether the applicant signaled and this is for all 236 programs that were included in the data analysis. 
And as you can see by the numbers, the probability of interviewing was almost double if the applicant sent a signal to a program compared to if they did not. And please note the little associated dotted lines adjacent to those purple squares, which represents the variation across programs. The big takeaways from the slides here, I'm not a big statistician, I'll give you the gist of it. Um, essentially, sending a program signal does not guarantee an interview invitation. However, not sending this signal does not exclude an applicant from receiving an application or uh, receiving an interview invitation. And is emergency medicine participating in signaling? Of course we are. You heard us talk about this at CORD. Um, but there are some minor changes uh, for the sake of consistency and messaging to all applicants across all specialties. ARIS has adopted a universal program um, that applicants should signal any program that they're interested in, regardless of home or away rotation. Um, and this is opposite of our approach as a specialty compared to last year. Um, so we want to make sure that our messaging this year to our advisees is consistent with the message as you see on the screen. Um, so as a result, we've decided to increase the signal number to seven, which is a combination of the five that we had last year and the two essentially freebies um, that were that were the uh, home and away rotations. And we kind of want to provide some context uh, comparing emergency medicine to other participating specialties with the SUP app. Um, you can see here there's pretty wide variation in approach uh, regarding signaling use. Um, the majority of programs really kind of limited their number of signals to maintain that individual value of each signal. But um, some of the competitive surgical specialties actually opted for a higher number which kind of served as a de facto application cap. Um, other programs have decided to take on a two-tier approach where the gold signals are of the highest value and of the least uh, number, so the most desirable programs. But then the silver ones uh, kind of increase in number and they're still relatively de desirable compared to a non-signal program. Um, and this model has the ability also to kind of serve as a pseudo application cap, um, but also maintaining the value associated with those gold signals, which are low in number. The ARIS Application Working Group, which is an offshoot of the CORD Application Process Improvement Committee, uh, will be following all of this data very closely for all of the specialties that have chosen alternate approaches, and we'll see which kind of which model proves most beneficial over the next year, and we'll explore that further if emergency medicine needs to change its approach. But for this year, we we went with seven, and we're sticking with it. So um, the signaling component will look relatively similar in ARIS compared to last year. There's some very subtle changes. Um, if, a pro, if an applicant signals your program, instead of seeing the word yes, they're going to see a little badge icon. We haven't been shown what the icon actually looks like yet. So for now, you're just gonna see the word badge, um, but there will be a little icon there if, a, if an applicant signaled your program. If the applicant um, does not signal your program or they skip the question altogether, then no information will be displayed. So that part is very similar to last year. And new for this year, something that everyone was asking for last year, um, programs will have, or program leaders will have the ability to hide the presence of a signal, whether they choose to do so at the time of application review or when it comes time for uh, faculty and others to interview the candidates, they will be able to turn on and turn off that feature at their discretion. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see how programs end up using that feature. All right, so let's get into some instructions for programs. So even though EM as a specialty is participating, individual programs can still choose whether or not they want to participate, but we hope that you all do choose to participate. If you do want you to participate, and even if you participated in the past, you must opt in each year. You can do that on your ARIS account maintenance page, which is now open, it opened last month, and you need to do so by June 30th. There are no exceptions to this deadline. Unfortunately, there were several programs that really wanted to be involved last year, but did miss the deadline and they did not make any exceptions. Um, 
The other thing to note is once you do opt in, you cannot drop out. And that is because applicants can start entering their preferences as early as July when the list gets um, posted for them to see. Um, so it wouldn't be fair for an applicant to potentially choose your program and then you drop out. All right, so I also wanted to review some prohibited actions when you do opt in for programs program signaling or when you're using the geographic preference information. So first, if you do not see a response to the geographic preference or program signaling section, you cannot ask the applicant their preferences or where they sent their signals, nor can you ask them why they did not choose your geographic region or program. You cannot disclose the identity of an applicant who has sent your program a signal. And lastly, you should not be using these for your rank order list or preference lists created during the SOAP. So again, driving that home as far as guidelines go. Now, these are not prohibited actions or you must do these things, but some general guidelines that we suggest. Um, only use geographic preferences and signals for interview offer. This is the way that they were designed to help you identify high um, high likelihood uh, applicants, those who would be highly likely to accept your interview offer. But as we know, both programs preferences change as well as applicants preferences change after the interview. So if you're using that signal or the preference after the interview and during the rank phase, it's really using it in a way that it was never originally intended. Um, likewise, do not give undue weight to preferences or signals. View them more as a plus factor, not the only factor, which I don't think anybody would, but just want to put that one out there. Um, assume applicants preferences or lack of a preference are genuine and I really want to drive home the lack of a preference as well. So unfortunately, in some of the specialties that did participate in geo preferencing this past year, we did see some data that um, those who chose a lack of preference, um, maybe did not have the same advantages as those who chose a particular geographic region. Um, again, it only happened in some specialties, but I think a lot of that has to do do with education on what lack of a preference really means. So that means an applicant is willing to go anywhere. Maybe what is valuable to them is yes, they're looking for a big research program or they're looking for the perfect mentor and geographics um, does not come into play. So still highly consider those with lack of a preference. Um, I also don't overinterpret a missing response or use them to filter out applicants. As Liz said, last year, 10% of applicants chose not to participate in geographic preferences. We may similarly have applicants who choose not to participate in geo preferences or program signaling, and that's going to look exactly the same as somebody who does choose to participate but does not choose your program. So lack of a, of a response or a missing response doesn't necessarily mean no interest. And lastly, don't assume no signal means no interest. And I have a graph here that I kind of want to use to drive this point home. So a lot of strategy goes into why an applicant chooses to send a signal. And when we look at this graph, you can see individual programs across the bottom here, and you can see in light blue the number of applications or number of applicants to each individual program, in dark blue the number of program signals received by each program. So you can see that there was a program that received almost 1,500 applications this past year, and there were programs that received in the low 100s, obviously wide variability. And so those programs that receive a ton of applications and a ton of signals may not value those signals as much as those who receive less. And so this strategy is going on in advisors and applicants' minds when choosing to signal a program. If they know that your particular program is highly competitive, they may find that that signal would be lower yield. And so while they would love to come to your program, they may choose to use their signal at a place where they feel like it would be more likely to impact their probability of receiving an interview. Likewise, if an applicant is from your particular state, we actually have data data that shows uh, in-state interview offers are higher even without the preference of a geo preference, even without the presence of a program signal or a geo preference. Um, so applicants may choose not to signal their in-state programs because they feel they already have high chances of getting an interview there. So again, lots of strategy going into the choice of signals. Just don't assume because somebody didn't signal you, you're not one of their top programs.
All right, so we gave you a lot of information here today, and I didn't really grasp myself all the changes to the application until I looked at this ERIS applicant worksheet, which you can get to from this QR code. While yes, it's designed for the applicants to work through their own application before they enter it into um, the actual system, uh, it gives you a really great idea of what is and is not included in the new application. So I highly recommend you checking that out. Obviously, we've been talking a lot about what applicants are now going to input into ERIS. Obviously, from PW, PDWS and DWS, you're going to be seeing a lot of this new information as well. So the experiences, your preferences, program signals will all be viewed on the applicant details page. Um, and all of this new data will be available in filters, exports, be available for screening options. Um, and new data will also be available when you print out those My ERIS CBs and applicant summaries. If you have any questions further about what these um, new changes are going to look like, you can go to the My Eris website, um, which we will have at the end of the slide. All right, so before um, we uh, end for questions, we also wanted to bring up the new collaboration between Thalamus and the AAMC. You may have seen our recent post on the cordless serve about this announcement. And while we're not endorsing one product personally or as an organization, we did want to make you aware of this collaboration should you want to use it to your advantage. So every program that uses ERIS, so likely every EM program here, um, will be able to access three of Thalamus's products for free, Thalamus Core, Thalamus Itinerary Wizard, and Cerebellum. There are two other Thalamus products that are available for additional fee, but will not be included for free. That's Cortex and Thalamus Video. So today we're just gonna cover those free products um, and you know what they can offer for you. I also wanna mention before we talk about each of these products, for any of those programs that were using the ERIS interview scheduler, you may want to pay attention because that is no longer going to be available to you. Eris is getting rid of that due to this new collaboration. So Thalamus will essentially be the scheduler through Eris. All right, so Thalamus Core. This is a lot more than just an interview scheduling program. I was actually quite surprised to see all of the things that it has to offer. So um, from the program director side, it can really provide you with sophisticated data and analytic tools to help you with applicant screening in a more equitable way by looking at gender distribution and um, race and ethnicity distribution. There are also configurable scoring algorithms and a notes section to help faculty evaluate candidates, which really helps minimize extraneous paper versions and stores everything all in one central location. There is also a rank order list um, ability and a sorter where you can drag and drop. And then this list easily exports into the NRMP R3 system for rank order list submission. And you can also generate customizable photo rosters or interview day reports in seconds, which is really kind of cool to create these little baseball cards. From the program coordinator side, uh, Thalamus Core allows you to manage multiple rounds of interviews for applicants, as well as social events, second looks, other recruitment gatherings, all in one central location, one central calendar. Core also gives you the ability to order and pull your wait lists, and you can also build applicant and faculty schedules specific to your interview day agenda well in advance of interview day. And then when you add the product of Thalamus Itinerary Wizard, you really um, get even more options for creating your schedules. So it helps streamline and automate the creation of faculty and applicant interview schedulers, incorporating faculty availability, applicant and program preferences, and the ability to create one-on-one, -on -one, panel, or group meetings. Templates can be customized, saved, replicated very easily. And whether or not you decide to use Thalamus's custom virtual interview platform, which again costs a fee, um, or you want to stick with Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Cisco WebEx, whatever you've been using, the itinerary wizard is still able to automatically assign all virtual interview links and creation of each interview day schedule. All right, so as medical educators, we all love feedback. So I think you're, a lot of you are gonna be excited about Cerebellum. So Cerebellum is a data and analytics dashboard that provides program performance measures 
and outcomes compared to other same specialty programs. So opportunities include metrics about applicants interviewed, waitlisted, ranked, matched, as well as cancellations compared to other programs. And other options include a review of program versus specialty performance in terms of DEI outcomes or geographic distribution. So this can really break down your interview season and see where you may have opportunities to improve in future seasons. All right, so what are your next steps for utilizing these free tools? If you go to this QR code, this is the Thalamus and AAMC collaboration website. It has a lot of brochures on here and a lot of links to videos to learn more about all of these different products. Um, but if you scroll down to the four program section, um, you can click on this uh, orange rectangle to go to the program interest form. You just put in a little bit of information about you and your program, and then a Thalamus team member will contact you about next steps. And why do you really need to do this if it's free? Really, they want to do this so that they can help you onboard and give you various training options to learn about these products. The other thing that you will need to do is accept the terms of use, and you can do that directly through PDWS starting on June 21st. Now, there's no deadline to sign up for this. You can do so at any time, um, even during interview season. Um, but obviously, the earlier you kind of sign in to do this or sign up to do this, um, the, the earlier you can learn about all the different options that are available to you so you can plan for your interview season. All right. So um, the My Aris Application and Program Signaling website for 2023-2024 is already updated with a ton of information. There's recorded webinars. There are guides um, for applicants. There's going to be a program director guide up there shortly. Um, there are FAQs. There's so many things on the website, and they will continuously update that website. We are still working on our end on our EM specific website and our EM specific guide. So as soon as we have that information all together, we will post that to our own website as well, where we will then link to the ARIS website and this webinar as well. Um, and that is all that we have for you right now. So we will open it up to questions. So first of all, a tremendous thank you to Alexis and Liz for not only this particular Cord Connects, but the incredible amount of work they have been doing over the last few years, I think they have revolutionized the application process to emergency medicine residencies, and that is not an overstatement. So thank you both very, very much. If you have any questions for the hosts, feel free to either unmute and ask your question or post your question in the chat. Uh, I know there was a question that was posted earlier that Liz suggested we can come back to at the end. Uh, and that question was, should people, should applicants use the optional essay to discuss things such as leave of absence, exam course failures, repeats, et cetera? So, uh, yeah, I, you know, when we got the data from the double AMC, they listed kind of what they expected, you know, significant, very significant hardships. And when they gave us the, the data for questions or responses and themes that did not align with the original intent of the question, the examples that they listed included academic struggles, getting accepted into medical school or residency. So I think it's really on the spectrum. And I would probably say it depends on what caused that academic struggle. Like if you're in a horrific car accident and you're hospitalized on the trauma service for four weeks, of course you're not gonna do well on that clerkship or, or something like that. So I think it depends on what the explanation is behind the struggle. But like someone just saying, oh, I'm a bad test taker. Or, oh, it took me you know, two or three times to take the MCATs. A lot of applicants to medical school and a lot of applicants to residencies have those same issues. So this is meant to be for some of those more profound experiences in life. Thank you. Uh, the next question says, ERAS has already started to change its look since match day. Are the changes I'm seeing now a preview of what the new look will be? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't really noticed the changes myself. So um, if you could throw me some examples, maybe I can say yes or no. Um, I do. I saw one of the email communications that they are starting, like instead of doing one fell swoop in case there's glitches, I do believe that they're making incremental changes live throughout until the application season. 
Yeah. And they're also very committed. I feel like this year more or over the past year, more than any other years to communicate and over communicate any changes um, or any updates that are occurring. And if people who are on um, this call here are not on any of those listservs. Um, we will still, as your representatives to the group, be sending it out over the cord listserv so you will get all that communication as well. Thank you. Uh, so they, they posted that an example is the scoring is now on the left of the screen. There is a new baseball card look to the photo. The status is easily editable from the applicant details screen, et cetera. So I'm not sure, um, I have not had access uh, to kind of see what those new changes look like, but I imagine there are going to be a lot of changes like the baseball card look. Um, I know that's something that's, you know, offered through Thalamus as well. Um, I don't know, Liz, if you can kind of add anything else to that comment. I don't have access to it at the moment. I'd have to defer to our current program director and coordinator. Um, all I know is, you know, I, I do think they're going to be doing those incremental changes, but it sounds like um, easily editable. It sounds like a, a very proactive and positive change. So I'm very optimistic. And the other thing that I want to say is, you know, this working group is going to continue to meet over the next year um, and continue to look at all these changes. So just because changes occurred this year doesn't mean they're here to stay. They're going to continue to have focus groups and surveys um, to continue to work on the content and make it uh, the most useful for both applicants and programs. Thank you. Any other questions from the group? So uh, I, I think this is probably one of the largest changes to the application process that we've seen in recent years. Uh, so I'm sure we're all a little apprehensive about what this is going to bring, but it sounds like you outlined it very clearly for us so we know what to expect. And in emergency medicine, I think we're used to pivoting and adjusting on the fly, so we should be fine with these new changes. I really want to thank once again both Alexis pelletier Bowie and Elizabeth Worley for all their hard work and really the entire APIC committee for everything they do to help us with application process. Uh, this session will be recorded and will be posted on the CORD website. So if anyone wants to review or if there's anyone who missed it and wants to watch it later, it will be available shortly on the website once it's uh, compiled. Uh, I thank our hosts. I thank all of you for participating. I thank our presenters, I'm sorry. I thank all of you for, for, for participating today. I wish everyone the best of luck with application season. All the best to everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having us.